More than 100 academics at major universities in London have decided to set up a new council for academic freedom in an attempt to combat cancel culture. The London University's Council for Academic Freedom has been inspired by a similar movement in the United States based around Harvard. It will encompass all the universities in the capital, with the priority being to defend the principles of free inquiry, intellectual diversity and civil discourse. John Armstrong, a lecturer in financial mathematics at King's College London, is one of the co-founders and he joins me now. Welcome to the show. Thanks for coming. So, free inquiry, intellectual diversity, civil discourse, all of that sounds fairly reasonable, but it also sounds like the default expectation for higher education. But is that not the case anymore? Well, one of the surprising things that happened this week, we had our launch event on Monday, and as you say, it's fairly innocuous sounding um, principles, principles, principles. Yeah. principles. But the, um, we had demonstrators, we had demonstrators, and some of them were actually in tears. Um, really? They're very upset. So there were demonstrators against free inquiry, free inquiry. intellectual diversity, and uh, civil discourse. Yeah, I mean, they didn't, they didn't make it clear which of the yeah, three, which of the, three <laughs> them the, most. the most problematic. But if they're crying, if they're actually in tears, I mean, <laughs> what exactly? What exactly do they want? Censorship, intellectual homogeneity, and uncivil discord. Yeah, I mean, I think, so there's, I think the starting point is probably intellectual homogeneity. Right, okay. I think that people are uncomfortable um, with disagreement and they find it difficult um, being challenged. And to me, that, that, that goes against the purpose of academia. For, for me, being challenged is the absolute essence of academia. Yes. And then, then I think the... The other aspects really just just follow from that. If you don't, if you're not willing to be challenged, if you're not willing to debate, then you'll try and shut people down, so you lose the free inquiry and that intolerance. That's what leads to the breakdown of civil discourse. So there, there's a recent book by Greg Lukianoff and Ricky Schlott called "The Cancelling of the American Mind," and this is, they've studied, they've looked into the statistics of cancellations in American universities, and they found that in terms of professors, academics being fired for their opinions. Uh, you'd have to go back to the McCarthy era for anything comparable. In fact, what we're living through now is far worse, statistically, than McCarthyism. And people still tell me there's no problem with free speech on campus. Why do they keep denying the observable truth? Um, I, have I have no idea. I think the... I, I really wish that we could get the leadership of universities to acknowledge the fact that there is a problem um, with academic freedom. And I think the only way at the moment that we're likely to succeed in that is through the courts. Right. So um, there are various cases um, that, that, that are going, going through the employment tribunals at the moment, and I think that's going to wake universities up. And the other thing that is going to wake the universities up is the new Higher Education Freedom of Speech Bill. Yes. So I think that's going to make them acknowledge there's a problem. But don't you think when you have high-profile cases, such as that of Kathleen Stock at the University of Sussex, and you see that, and you see students dressing up in masks, setting off flares, scrawling threats, uh, basically driving uh, a member of staff to the point where she has to resign. How can people then deny? I mean, that's just so high profile. People are now seeing it with their own eyes. And yet it's, it seems to be in the interests of certain people to just pretend that's not real. Yeah, I mean, I think it's just very difficult because it opens up to university management there's a really challenging problem they have to face that. Um, they've got a real difficulty. They've got to work with EDI teams that actually five seconds ago were supporting the cancellation. They've only just recently realised that actually... I mean, there was a point when an employment tribunal um, said that holding gender-critical beliefs wasn't worthy of respect in a democratic society. Yes. And everybody in university EDI went, great, in that case, we can do what we like with those people because... Yes. Their views are not worthy of respect. There was an appeal, and suddenly they became protected beliefs. Yes. And the EDI teams had to, you know, turn on a dime and start protecting beliefs and leave a few seconds. Well, they haven't done a very vilifying. good job, to be honest. So this is the problem, really. You've got these bodies, Equity, Diversity and Inclusion, EDI, embedded into various administrative roles throughout higher education in the UK. And this is a group, effectively, whose job it is to censor, uh, to clamp down, to drive people away. Uh, and in fact, to exclude in the name of inclusion. So well, I wouldn't, say, I wouldn't say that's their job. I, I, mean, would say, <laughs> I would say it's the upshot of what they do. Yeah, I mean, on the other hand, 
the there is a need within universities, um, I think, for EDI because we do need to, for example, maintain civil discourse. We do need to help people get along together when they have different views and different backgrounds. So there's a need for EDI. Well, I um, think that's the opposite of what EDI does. Well, I think that's true at the moment, but this is where I hope that um, groups like ours can come in because we're, we're hoping to try and provide sort of policy guidance to yeah. universities that we, we really hope will actually provide a sensible way forward to navigate these um, these issues because universities are going to have to navigate this and they are going to have to find a way to both support their trans staff and students and their gender critical staff and students and they're going to have to support their Muslim students and their Jewish students and they're We've got to learn to live but, together. But nobody is against all of that. I mean, the, like every student, every viewpoint should be protected and supported. The problem is when you've got a group of people who claim to be promoting diversity, when they do the exact opposite, wouldn't it be easy just to fire everyone who doesn't do their job properly? Well, that, that was a question that, that was asked um, at our launch event on Monday. Yeah. Um, and I think there's quite a few people in the room who rather <laughs> like the idea of getting rid of the EDI teams. But the... But the one has to work within the framework of the law. Um, EDI does need to exist. And so we've got to work with the people there and find a way forward. You can do things like retrain people. Um, you can explain to people the importance of academic freedom. And so, for example, I, I'm not aware of any training courses at our university on academic freedom, mm. but we could introduce something like that. And that, I think those kind of practical steps would yes. uh, re really help. But when academics like you speak out about this, do you get any flack? I mean, there's a lot of academics who, who have the fashionable opinions, uh, who quite like the current censorship that goes on. And it's good for them because they're not the ones who get censored and they don't have to bother arguing with people they disagree with. So do you get any flack from those types? Well, I'm relatively lucky because as a man, I seem to get less flack than women. They seem to um, get a bit more abuse targeted at them than me. But yeah, yeah, I think everybody involved in this gets some, some level of abuse, some level of discrimination. And the more one speaks out on it, the, the more discrimination one receives. John Armstrong, thanks very much for joining me.